This is Studio 809. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Outdoors Hiking Bob podcast. I'm your host, Hiking Bob. You can find me on my website at hikingbob.com, which has links to my social media accounts, my columns at the Colorado Springs Independent, all the other podcasts I've done, my photography website. You can also uh, drop me a line there with the contact me link and, and ask me a question, offer a suggestion, make a comment on these podcasts or anything like that. If you have any questions about trails, whatever you want to know or whatever you want to ask, just go to hikingbob.com and just leave me a message. You can also sign up for my free newsletter. It comes out about once a week and it highlights the most recent columns and podcasts and any other neat news that I may have come up with that uh, just doesn't fit in either one of those things. And uh, it's free and it just comes out once a week and uh, you can just sign up for it there. Um, today we are continuing with the series of groups that are part of the 2022 Pikes Peak Give campaign, which is a big, big fundraiser here in the Pikes Peak region. And today is another one of those groups, and you've had, you've heard them on here before, and we're bringing them back because they just do some great work. And I am speaking today with Interim Executive Director of the Rocky Mountain Field Institute, Carl Woody. Hi, Carl. Hey, Bob. Thanks so much for having us on again. Um, love chatting with you. So it's a okay. pleasure. Appreciate the work you guys do here. So let's get, let's uh, kind of start with the beginning. Talk, tell us about Rocky Mountain Field Institute. We known you guys around here as Remfi, um, because it's a lot less words. <laughs> yep. And and what it is you guys do in the Pikes Peak region for our trails and open spaces. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah, as we're known on the streets, as I like to say, we're known as Remfi. Um, so Rocky Mountain Field Institute is a 501c3 nonprofit based right here in the Springs. Um, our mission is to conserve and protect public lands in Southern Colorado. Um, and we achieve our mission through a number of different ways, um, primarily through volunteer-based stewardship projects. So stuff like trail maintenance, trail construction, habitat restoration work, wildland fire mitigation work, riparian area restoration. Um, we also have a number of educational programs. So environmental education programs like our Earth Corps pro- program would be our, um, you know, kind of our premier education program, um, which is one of my favorite programs we run each year. Um, and then we also, um, devote time to restoration research. So, um, primarily in the form of, you know, returning to pr- previous re- project work sites and, um, you know, seeing what worked and seeing what didn't and, um, you know, adjusting our, our methods and techniques, um, based off that research. So, um, you know, we really have a presence, uh, I would say across the entire Pikes Peak region. So, um, we work across, um, land management jurisdictions. So, you know, we work with the city of Colorado Springs, um, El Paso County, the Bureau of Land Management down near Canyon City um, out of their Royal Gorge field office. We also have a a strong partnership with uh, the U.S. Forest Service here in the Pikes Peak Ranger District. So, um, yeah, we we are honored and pleasured to to steward the public lands in and around Pikes Peak. Um, We love doing what we do. Um, We love getting people involved with what we do. Um, and it's just a pleasure uh, to be of service to, to this community and, and to these public lands. Great. So give people an idea of a trail they may have been on or an open space they may have visited or something like that that you guys would have had some hand in creating or restoring or something like that. Yeah, sure. So uh, we actually just wrapped up our field season um, last week. So I guess that would have been December 9th was our, our, our final field day. Um, and so one of the projects we were working on in the fall was on the Cabin Canyon Trail um, in, in the Garden of the Gods, um, doing a lot of um, tread repair on that trail. Um, we also built some some pretty awesome timber steps to kind of mitigate um, a pretty massive goalie that was um, forming on a, on a fall line trail. So put in some timber steps there um, to kind of make that that hike not only safer and more enjoyable for the users, but also it's protecting those surrounding natural resources, protecting that vegetation. So um, that's just one example of of one of our recent projects. But we, like I said, have a presence in in pretty much every single open space and park in and around Colorado Springs. Um, So we worked at Palmer Park, Blodgett Peak Open Space, um, Stratton Valley, Stratton Open Space, um, you know, you name it, we've we've probably had a project there this year. So um, very excited to, to be able to you know, provide those places, um, with some, some love and care. The trail you're talking about, that's the one that comes off of the, um, Siamese twins parking lot. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That little, it looks kind of a really nice little loop there with some nice views and some rocky areas and yeah. And, and we stuff were really, like that. it's been a while since I've been on there, but it's a pretty nice little trail. And, and that's why we were kind of excited to get the opportunity to work there this year. Cause it, it, being in the location in the park that it is, it, it really is 
challenging and doesn't quite enough get enough attention um, as other parts of the park. So um, we were really excited to, to get out there and, and share the love with with uh, you know an undervalued I think sometimes portion of the park. So um, it just goes to show that you know each park is different, each open space is different. Some places receive more attention than others, and um, we want to make sure that we're we're sh- we're sharing that that effort and, and um, impact across the board. When I came in here, I was looking at your sign up there for the Mount Muskoko Trail. Um, which was a trail that I had a, a big hand in building in North Cheyenne Canyon uh, when I was part of the friends group there. And that goes back some years. <laughs> yep. But you guys were a big part of that project and a lot of the technical support, building all those steps that had to go in there to make that happen. And uh, you guys had a big, big hand in getting and getting that project done. So that's a trail that people might um, are probably feel pretty familiar with people listening to this podcast or if they haven't, they want to go check it out. And, and take a look at that. It's a, it's a, that was quite an engineering feat. There's a lot of hard labor that went in that, in that project. Yeah. I, I, thanks for saying that. So that was actually before my, my time at yeah. Rimfi. Um, but it was actually one of the very first hikes I actually went on when I, when I moved here, um, beautiful work and, um, it really just got me excited. I mean, that was my, maybe my first or second weekend in town and, um, just seeing the work that went into, to constructing that, that trail was, um, pretty incredible and got me really, really stoked to, to get to do that too. I so. think we put in like 80 or oh, almost a hundred steps to that's make a lot, that project. That's a lot of work. And some of those, it's hard to tell from there. We won't get too much into the weeds, but especially at the first set of steps, uh, you can't tell it by, by walking on it now, but some of those timbers are five and six deep just to, just to get that right um, step, which is, you know, to make those steps where they're not, you know, so steep that they cause erosion and other issues. But that kind of speaks to the, the level of expertise that historically has been part of Remfi and the work they do because me going out there and trying to build this, I would, it would just been a slope and it would have been eroded and it just been a mess, but you know, it's hard to tell, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of lumber under there. Oh yeah. And, and, you know, I think that's one thing that, um, you know, makes Remfi pretty special is that we're, we're, we are consistently, um, you know, sought out by, by our partners for, for our expertise and, and the attention and detail we put into our projects. I, I think another great example, more recent example, maybe of kind of that engineering, um, we worked on a project with a new partner. So we've partnered with um, Manitou Springs Parks and Rec, and we um, were working on improving a switchback on the Red Mountain Trail, um, which is just right off the Paul Intamin Trail up, mm-hmm. up in Manitou. And uh, yeah, one of our, our former program managers put together this amazing blueprint schematics for um this really impressive uh timber retaining wall with some integrated timber steps and um i think it came out great um it's really beautiful work but again just kind of shows the the expertise and and, and detail and and attention to um you know quality product that that we like to bring i think i know the switchback you're talking about the red mountain trail it needs help oh yeah (laughs) i agree with some work that was just the tip of the iceberg so we're hoping to get back out there with manitou springs next year and um, you know, address some more issues on the Red Mountain Trail. It definitely needs some love. So I'm excited for that that new partnership. Cool. So let's talk about the work you guys do during the course of the year. You're not just building trails, but you mentioned doing some restoration work. Give us an idea of some places that you've helped restore and give, bring. You kind of talked about the one trail in, in Garn of the Gods, but what other restoration work have you guys done? How have you gone back in there and fixed the effects of Mother Nature and increased user um, traffic? Yeah, um, I think a really great example of that from this year was our work up at Rampart Reservoir Recreation Area. Um, so this was a, par- a project through a partnership with the Colorado Water Conservation Board as well as the U.S. Forest Service. Um, so if you've been up to Rampart Reservoir, you've probably seen those, you know, hundreds of, of kind of gullied sections running straight down the slope, straight into the reservoir. Um, and those are actually really detrimental to the the quality of the water at the reservoir because again, that's a municipal water source as well as a recreation area. So it's really important to to make sure that we're we're giving that the the care and attention it needs as well. So um, we had a crew out there for oh, close to thirty days, I think, just up at Rampart Reservoir. Um, you know, putting in check dams, um, putting down some erosion control matting. We did a lot of seeding up in the area to try and you know establish that vegetation. Um, which can help stabilize those slopes and, and will also, you know, reduce that, that erosion. Um, so, you know, protecting water is, is you know, a, a primary goal of, of many of our projects. Um, you know, water is a really important resource in this area. And 
um, we want to do everything we can to, to make sure that um, we're doing our part to make sure that it stays clean and, and um, friendly to, to people and to wildlife, right? Um, so another example would be, you know, the Bear Creek watershed with the, the threatened greenback cutthroat trout up there. We, we spend quite a bit of time up in Bear Creek um, closing down social trails, illegal trails. Um, you know, this Pikes Peak granite, it's so erosive and erodible. It just pours right into those water bodies. It's and, like walking on marbles. Yeah, it's it's really, um, it's quite a, a challenge to contend with um, in this area. So, um, yeah, so, so that's some examples of our restoration work. Um, you know, and, and then around town, I think, you know, our, our partners that we, you know, through conversations, they were really struggling with the 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 extent of social trails, illegal trails that have been popping up on their properties. Um, that's also an uphill battle. Um, but so another example of our restoration work would be closing down those, those illegal trails in our, um, city and county properties and, and, um, you know, seeding, um, making sure that we're, um, you know, trying to get those, those trails back to, to the way they were before. Um, you're talking about the the the, uh, the work on Rampart uh, Reservoir. I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about the trail that, that, that goes around the perimeter of the reservoir. So we actually didn't do really any any actual trail work on on the Rampart Reservoir loop. Um, so our, our our priorities up there were to address like those er- erosion issues occurring, okay. you know, on on the the water sh- on the shores, the water oh, banks. Gotcha. Because I'm thinking about some of that area on the on the south side of the reservoir that was affected by the Waldo Canyon fire that I'm, I'm guessing might've been part of that because there's still, the vegetation still slow coming back and there is some erosion. And if you've hiked that trail, you've seen some of that stuff just kind of like you talked about that Pikes Peak granite, which is just, just marbles and just kind of floats right down into the trail. And then, like you said, down into the, into the, into the reservoir itself. Yeah. And that's, it's something that I, I you know, I, I want people to be thinking about with, with, you know, being safe with fire because it takes, decades sometimes hundreds of years for that that vegetation to grow back and um and that's really like you know our first line of defense when it comes to erosion mudslides and stuff is is solid vegetation on those on those steep slopes particularly like you said with this with this type of material on on the slopes so um yeah it takes a long time for that stuff to come back um so let's all be smart and safe with with our fires um yeah all you have to do is go look at the Heyman burn scar, which is oh 10 years gosh. before the Waldo Canyon burn scar fire. And it's still a, a moonscape. And that's been 20 years now, I think almost. Right. It's been quite a long time. So um, it does take a long time for these things to recover. And for people not li- people listening who are not familiar with it, the, there is a a particular type of rock called Pikes Peak Granite. This is about the only place on earth that it lives. And I think a seam of it pops up in Missouri or something by some hmm. weird thing. There's, there's a sign at Flores and Fossil Beds National Monument that has a thing on there, but it's a specific site type of granite that, and and, and um, geologists get mad when I say it, but it's porous. They're going to say it's not the right word, but it's the best way to describe it. Water seeps into it. It expands. It crumbles. It's, it's granite you can't do anything with. You can't build with it, which is probably what kept Pikes Peak from becoming a big quarry. But it's very crumbly and it's very it's very sharp, and it crumbles under your feet and it's hard to work with and it erodes, and it's a unique feature of the Pikes Peak Massive and it's one of those things you have to deal with. So it takes somebody who's familiar with it, like your group, to deal with it. If you brought in uh, a trail company from the other part of the country that's never dealt with Pikes Peak granite, they'd probably be pulling their hair out. Yep. Because they'd probably be picturing rocks they can just carve steps into, and here you can't do that. Some really nice mineral soil, right? You know, um, it it is something to contend with. You're right. Um, We, and what it really requires is is a lot of forethought and and proper planning. Um, You know, step number one is is making sure that you have a really good alignment um, and a sustainable alignment for, for any new trail you're putting in. And um, that way you can, you can avoid the worst of it if, um, if, you know, as best you can. So, um, but yep, we contend with, with Pikes Peak granite, uh, on a daily basis here. And it's just kind of the way of life, part of, part of what we do. So, um, I'm, I'm thankful to have that experience and to have the experience of the other folks here at Rimfi and, and our volunteers who, who've worked with it for, you know, decades. And, um, so we really just kind of rely on, um, you know, the experiences and, and knowledge of, of the folks in our community to, to contend with those challenges. 
I'm convinced the Pikes Peak Grand is why I get half the life out of a pair of hiking boots <laughs> that people in other parts of the country do. It is very sharp rock. It and is. And if you've ever tripped and fallen on it, you come up looking like you got hit by a car because it's just road rash. So it's a, it's a it unique rocks feature. rocks out of your skin. You oh, know. yeah. And it's stuff. It's, it's, a, it's a nightmare. But it's a unique feature. It is. That we have here. And you guys know how to deal with it. We kind of mentioned the Waldo Canyon um, fire just a bit there. You guys were a major part in the restoration of that, correct? Yep, that's right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, again, that was before my time, but obviously it's a, it's a huge part of our, our, our history here in, in, in the Pikes Peak region in Colorado Springs, but it's also a big part of Rimfuse history. Um, that was kind of a turning point, um, I think for, for the organization and, um, you know, that, that really gave us the opportunity to, to think about what else can we do for this community? Um, and so that was a great process. So yeah, the restoration work, um, was primarily er erosion control and then revegetation, um, up in that burn scar. Uh, again, vegetation is the first line of defense when it, when it comes to stopping erosion. So, um, I'd have to go back and look at some of the historical statistics, but we put in, you know, hundreds of, of log erosion barriers, we call them LEBs. Um, you know, these are just structures that we place along the slopes to, to catch sediment, um, from, from pouring down hills. So, um, yeah, hundreds of those and, you know, planted hundreds of trees. Um, I'm sure a lot of seed went down up there yeah. as well. So, um, but yeah, it's a, you know, it's an important part of, of, you know, living here in, in, in the Springs and in the Pikes Peak region, it's, it's a part of our history. So, so something a little bit more recent, and I know you've been working on this and this is particularly exciting for me is the devil's playground trail on the West side of Pikes Peak. That's an ongoing project you've been working on for a couple of years now. And, and, you know, we have these such short seasons that you can get in there to work. You know, you got to, the snow on that side can be there for quite a while and comes early and stays late. How is that project going? Yeah, it's going really well. Um, you know, I think th there is a lot of attention on the on the Devil's Playground reroute. Um, rightfully so. It's a it's going to be an awesome trail. It's beautiful right now, and and once we you know connect it up to, you know, up in Devil's Playground, and, and people can start using it, they're going to see how awesome it is. Um, yeah, th there are challenges obviously with with any project we take on. Um, it is unique uh, in that it is that kind of that south you know that south face that north facing. Um, aspect. And, um, so we do contend with weather. Um, but you know, we spent 85 days working out there this summer, um, through a combination of, um, our staff volunteers. And, uh, we actually partnered with a mile high youth Corps um, to, to continue that project. And, you know, we're full steam ahead. Um, I think another challenge we contend with is, is project funding. So, um, that's always kind of the bottom line, unfortunately, for a for nonprofit organization is, um, you know, we have these awesome projects we want to get done, but we have to find um, someone gener generous enough to, to help us get it done. Um, so thankfully, you know, we have a number of amazing partners who've been working with us on the project for for a number of years now. Folks like the National Forest Foundation, Mile High Youth Corps has been an amazing partner. Um, obviously, the U.S. Forest Service, um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife has been a, a big supporter um, so we're, we're going back to the state trails grant committee, um, early next year to, to request some more funding for the project. Um, so hopefully we can, uh, you know, put forth the, the, the amount of effort that, that we really think the project deserves and we need funding to do that. So, um, that's, that's mission number one for, for me and my role right now is to, to make sure that all of these projects are, are getting the, the funding attention that they, that they need. And Colorado Parks and Wildlife, besides the Trail Grants Program, they have a lot of habitat, wildlife habitat in there. So I'm sure they're working closely with you to make sure that trail avoids that. Because if it doesn't, then you end up with seasonal closures and nobody wants to put all that work into it. Exactly. And then end up not being able to use it for... You know, there are some parts, there are some trails in this region that are closed for seven months out of the year. Right. Nobody wants to put a lot of work into that and then say, well, that's a nice trail. You can't use it for the for the prime hiking season because it goes into the wrong area. So having them as a partner obviously helps you avoid those issues. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that goes back to kind of what I mentioned before is that that planning before, you know, that 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 uh, that planning process is critical for for a project, particularly one of this scale. Right. Um, so. We worked really closely with with the wildlife managers from um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife. We we also worked with um, wildlife managers and and resource specialists from the Forest Service um, even before a shovel hit the ground on that particular project. So 
Um, we went through a few iterations of the alignment um, before we started construction because, you know, one of the first alignments actually did, they identified a pass through um, some big horde sheep habitat. And so, you know, we had to kind of go back to the drawing board because like you said, you know, one, obviously we don't want to be, you know, impacting, impacting wildlife like that, particularly the, the big horned sheep. But two, like you said, we don't want to invest all this time, effort and money into a project and, and, you know, have it be closed for, for half the year. Um, so I think again, proper forethought, um, planning, um, you know, it goes a long way. There are a few things that Colorado Parks and Wildlife is more protective of than their big horn sheep. They are very protective of it. Understandably, yeah, you sure. know, beautiful animals and, and need our attention, you know. And, and native to this area. So they're very protective of those. So it's, it's good that you're working with them. Um, how is the timeline of that project going? How much further down? I mean, like I so said, we have, you did, you worked there for about 85 days, you said. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking that was the only 85 days you can get in there because that's a really brief window you have opportunity you have in there. Yep. So, so you, no. you get to do the small amount of work out of a 12 month year. How far, how, how are we looking with that project going on? Yeah, sure. So I guess I should kind of, kind of paint the picture for you a little bit. So yeah, we have about three months out of the year that we can get, um, really decent weather and, and, you know, safe working conditions. Um, so we actually have rotating crews. So we'll have a crew in there for seven days. Then our mile high partners will come in for nine days at the end of their hitch. We'll send in our crew again. So literally every single day during that three month period, we had folks on the ground, um, completing work on the project. Um, the outlook, um, for project completion, we are looking at a few more years probably. Um, so, Again, this kind of goes back to the funding thing I was discussing. It's, you know, it's funding dependent. So if we, you know, have more funding, we can get more work done each year, right? We can have more staff on the project. Um, so it all kind of depends, um, on, on how much, um, support we can, we can get for the project. Um, but yeah, I'd say we're, we're still looking at a couple more years out for sure before that project's completed. I'm really excited, um, for this coming year, 2023, Um, so up until this coming year, we've been base camping out of the crags campground, um, which has been a great, um, you know, facility. It's a, it's a great, um, resource for us because, you know, we have clean drinking water, there's restrooms there and everything. So it's a little bit more like glamping than our folks are used to for (laughs) sure. Um, but the hike has gotten progressively longer and longer, right? So as we build more trail, the hike gets that much longer, um, so we're actually going to be doing, um, we're going to be base camping on a true kind of backcountry style base camp starting next season. So, um, I'm excited for that. I think our staff are excited for that. I'm sure the volunteers are going to be excited about that. Um, it's going to cut down on our hike time to and from the work site each day. Um, you know, really hoping to, um, increase efficiency and productivity on the project. You know, we've, we've implemented a number of things to really try and, um, kind of increase our output something we identified, um, in 2021 was a, kind of a material issue. So we were using, um, natively felled trees to, to use as material for a number of our trail structures. And what we realized was at the time, what we had been doing is cutting them as we needed them. Um, but as the season progressed, those trees would dry out. So it got hotter, uh, you know, warmer the trees with just less water. So they, they dry out, which made debarking those trees, exponentially more time consuming. Um, so we spent a lot more time than I, than I wish we would have, you know, debarking these trees. So this year, what we did was calculated exactly how many feet of, of timber that we'll need for the duration of the project and felled those trees early in the season and debarked them, which you know, I, I wish I had the, the proper calculation on, on, on the top of my head for you, but I cut our, you know, our material production, um, time, I would say probably in half at least. So, Good. Um, yeah, so there's a number of ways we can, we can improve and, and, um, you know, improve our productivity and efficiency for sure. And while this trail is being built, the original Devil's Playground Trail is still open. People still hike up there. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that was actually one of the first priorities for the project before we even began, um, working on the new reroute, we actually went back to the old trail and, and put in some stabilization structures just to make it, you know, a little bit more safe, a little bit more enjoyable for folks. Um, and, and protecting some of those surrounding natural resources that alpine tundra up there above tree line is so sensitive um that's why it's so important that this new trail go in so we can try and hopefully over time get that that impacted area back to 
to where we want to see it. Um, but yeah, so the first thing we did was kind of improve that trail a little bit um, so that folks could still have a, a good way to get to the top. And that section above treeline was terrible. Oh my gosh. I was just <laughs> was horrible. Up, I was just up there earlier this year collecting some data and uh, I, I it's, honestly, it's just gotten worse. Um, it's that Pikes Peak Granite again. Yeah, exactly. And, and folks trying to find the best way up. And so that means that they're just kind of finding their own way through that tundra and um, you know, it, I, I understand from the perspective of like, you're trying to find the, the easiest, fastest way up, but I just wish people would, you know, as they're going up, be mindful of, of the impact that they're having. Um, you know, that, that those Alpine plants take, you know, hundreds, if not thousands right. of years to reestablish. So, um, it's pretty impactful. And to be fair to the user, some of the, that the original trail went through deep gullies that you had to crawl down in and crawl out of. So I can understand why people try to find ways around it because you look at that and you know that it's loose soil and climbing in and out of those could be literally you were climbing in and out of gullies to get up there. So I'm sure the trail you guys build is going to be a whole lot better than what's up. And that's an old, old trail. It's been there for probably 100 some odd years. And Right. And not it, exactly the trail techniques we're using nowadays. Exactly. Thanks. I mean, that's exactly what I was going to mention. It goes back to that, that planning. So that trail was never really properly designed for sustainability, right? Mm-hmm. That's not something that they were considering back then. And so it was basically point A to point B. What's the, right. what's the fastest way I can do this? Um, straight up. Yeah, straight up. Right. And then that's where we're seeing all that, that impact and erosion. So, um, yeah, the new trail is, is, is gorgeous. Um, I'd invite you out sometime next year to go take a look at what we've, what we've done. I keep trying to do that. I haven't done it. I got to come out next year. Yeah, come check it out, Bob. Yep, I will. I definitely need to do that. Um, what are the big pro- – and you mentioned the backcountry camping. That was kind of like what you guys did at the Challenger and Kit Carson yep. Peak Project, and that was a multiple-year project. And there, I mean, for people who don't know, the kind of work you guys put in there, that was a mule train to get your stuff way up. I hiked that trail up to the lake. I didn't go all the way up to the peak, but – but to the lake up there and ran into your camp up there, that was a long way up a very steep trail to bring your stuff for a season and bring it all back yeah. down. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's a little more than a five mile hike um, to get up to the, to the base camp area. And, and a lot of elevation. Gain. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I, I remember my first trip going up there. I, I was amazed at our staff cause I was struggling <laughs> and they were just flying up that thing. So, um, I mean, thankfully, we've got really, really strong group of, of, of staff and volunteers who, who, who kind of love that type two type of fun, as we say around here, you know, that um, embrace the struggle kind of fun. Um, People a whole lot younger than me. Well, and me too, Bob, <laughs> honestly. Um, but yeah, so Kit Carson, that was a six-year project. Um, we wrapped that up um, in, at the end of 2020 um, and really happy with the, the work that was accomplished. So again, it, it just kind of goes to show, um, you know, how some of these really particularly large projects um, take time to complete. Um, similarly, so we are still working down in the Sangres, actually. Um, so we just wrapped up uh, the first year of one of our projects down in the South Connolly Lakes Basin area, um, working on the Broken Hand Pass Trail, which provides access to Cresto Needle and Cresto Point, two 14ers um, down in the Sangres. And again, that's another really tough area to access. Um, so we, we did do a little bit of work on a separate trail in the same area in 2021. And there's a, and I'll get to the, the exciting part, in my opinion, um, in just a second, but I'll give you a little back mm-hmm. backstory here. So our project down, down in the South Connolly Lakes area in 2021, there's an access road, a four service access road that's um, really only allowed for administrative use. So primarily search and rescue or any forest service folks. Um, but we were given um, permission by the San Carlos Ranger District to, to use that road um, to access uh, the basin itself. And our first day on the project, driving our, our vehicle up, um, just even to, to transport our material, have a catastrophic truck breakdown um, right there on that road because it's a super, really gnarly, um, really four-wheel drive road. And so... Um, after having that experience, thankfully we got the truck out, um, got some support, and this is um, where I'm really happy about. So we called an organization called Colorado 4x4 Rescue and Recovery. Um, we learned about them through a grapevine, basically, of contacts and called them. And this is an organization. I really want to shout them out. Um, they're specifically, their mission is to, to basically go out and rescue, um, you know, vehicles that have been stuck, rolled, all kinds of stuff out, out in the middle of nowhere. Um, it's a great group of folks. They're all volunteers. They've got these really awesome um, 
vehicles and equipment to to get out and, and get those vehicles um, safely out of the area. Um, so they we called them, and then the very next day they were out, had a team out, and, and got our truck repaired in the field and helped Re- us get it out of repaired there. Repaired it in the repaired field. Repaired it in the field. Wow. And, and helped us get it out uh, of the area. Um, so through that, this year we were very hesitant to take another truck up that road after that experience. So we actually reached back out um, to Colorado 4x4 Rescue as well as some other um, 4x4 volunteers um, of an organization also called CORE helped us out, but they volunteered to take our crews and equipment in, in and out of the project site, um, for each hitch. So, wow. um, it was a, it's a great partnership, really appreciate everything they did for us on that. Um, you know, and again, increased project time on project versus time transporting materials. Cause otherwise we would have been hiking up that trail, um, which would have taken, you know, four times as long. So, and, and that, and that part of the area the, the mountains, and you talked about the south, you know, that's the south Sangre de Cristos. It's completely different than the Pikes Peak Granite. There, you've got rocks the size of your fist. Yeah. And which means, and I don't know what happened to your truck, but you used to be able to drive up that road. They closed that road. You have to hike up it. Hiking up that is no fun. Nope. Because it's big rocks that just want to twist and turn under your feet. And I can imagine one of them kicking up and punching a hole in a transmission, a differential, a transfer case punching a hole in something you need for that truck to move. It was a transition line. Yep. Yeah. Transition fluid. Yep. yep. And it'll punch a hole in that stuff. And so it's difficult to work with. And again, being here and having that experience going from the Pikes Peak granite, which is just crumbly little rocks to big fist size rocks. Both of them are a challenge. You guys know how to work with all that kind of stuff. Yeah. They're both unique. They both require different techniques, um, you know, different types of structures. So um, down in, in the Sangres, down in the South Colony area, um, we're actually working primarily in, in talus slopes. So um, massive granite boulders, um, moving those around, making steps, building switchbacks, building retaining walls, um, doing some wayfinding. So building some really large cairns down there to help folks. Um, it's really exciting work. And I think, uh, you know, most of our staff um, really enjoy that particular type of work because they... Um, you know, the, the results, the visual results afterwards are, are pretty, um, stunning, you know, they're pretty stark, the, the before and after. So, um, it's really, um, enjoyable work and rewarding work. Um, I love before and after photos. It's a good way we tell our story and, um, some of the best ones come, come from those types of projects. So cool. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Though, you guys involved such good stuff. I, if I was 30 years younger, I'd still be too old, too old to do it, but it'd be so much fun being out there with you guys and digging. And we got and some other some... opportunities that I'm sure you could you could crush. You'd be awesome at it, Bob. Bring, come on out. I'll, I'll stick with the publicity part of things. <laughs> That's also appreciated. Yeah. No, I, I'd be. I would love to come out and work with you guys. <clears throat> One of the other things you guys do that you're part of is training people to do this kind of work. It's not just anybody can come out there with a shovel or a pick or and just start working. You've got to know what you're doing. You guys are one of the partners in the crew leader, the Pikes Peak Regional Crew Leader Training. Tell us about what that what that's all about. Yeah, this is an, another awesome partnership that we have. Um, so we're primarily partnering with with City of Colorado Springs, but we're also bringing in land management agency partners from across the region um, to participate, just so that we kind of have that unified voice from those land managers. Um, but the program is, is really geared towards um, those incredibly active volunteers um, that do a number of different stewardship activities in the, in the region. So whether that's working with a, one of the local friends group, whether that's a, a really frequent rim fee volunteer or a really frequent medicine wheel volunteer. Um, so it's really kind of harnessing that, that enthusiasm um, and, and dedication to, to trail work and restoration work and really trying to provide additional training for those folks so they can actually go out and lead crews on their own. Um, that is something that, that we've seen, um, kind of across the board is, um, you know, we have folks who are really interested in volunteering, but oftentimes our, our partners don't have the staff to, to run those volunteer program days. Um, and so by, by training some of those really enthusiastic volunteers in volunteer management, um, in leadership, um, in some more advanced trail building and, and, and restoration techniques, we can really provide um, to the community at large um, some skilled folks to help lead those volunteer days. So it's really a capacity building 
um, endeavor um, when you when you think about it. So it's a great it's a great opportunity for th- for folks who love doing trail work and getting out and getting their hands dirty. Um, I highly suggest if that's something you're into, um, check it out. Um, it's a two day training program. It takes place uh, over a weekend. Um, there's some classroom portions to the training, so that's kind of where we talk about that leadership training, that volunteer management training. Um, we talk L and T, so leave no trace um, training. Um, really all the things that, that someone would need to know before leading a volunteer day. Um, and then there's a kind of a field practical portion of the practicum portion of the, of the training where we actually go out to a work site and we'll do some more advanced trail training. We do, um, some restoration training and, and really just getting them the feel for, for what it's like to, to run a volunteer day. Um, it's a great program, love being partners in, in the program, um, yeah, and it's just a great resource for for the community and, and for our for our partners. That's great. I went through that training some years ago. As a matter of fact, about when we were starting the Mount Muskoka project, and mm-hmm. used that project as my field training for it. And I've kept up my certification because it's really valuable. Even if you're, I mean, obviously you want people to go through the training so that they continue to work out there. But even if you just sat in on it, you get a better appreciation about why trails are built the way they're built. There's a lot of questions. Why do you do it this way? That doesn't seem to make sense to me. You go through this training, you really begin to understand why things are done the way they're done and why there are structures in there where they used to not be and why trails go this way or that way and, and all kinds of stuff. You learn so much out of it um, that it just, I think it's valuable for just the general public to get a better feel. And then they understand why things are done the way they are and why some trails, I've used a trail forever. Why is it being closed? Well, not really that great of a trail. So we built a new one over this way and you kind of, you're going to get to the same place, but it's going to be a little different, like the devil's playground trail. Right. I I think the why is, is so important when we're talking trails, Um, you know, because without that that context and that understanding and that perspective on on you know the, the reason why we're doing this thing people just imagine it's it's done willy-nilly and without any thought and um and that's just that's not the case and that's never the case right um you know the, some of these decisions are made um because we're protecting the resource or we're protecting user safety or you know we're protecting wildlife so there's a lot of reasons why some of these um, different activities take place. And, and I think you're right. I think with a, with a better understanding of, of why some of these things are happening, we can really, I, I would hope, grow some support, additional support in the community and, and um, you know, really get folks to understand that, that the stuff we're doing isn't willy-nilly. There's, there's important reasons why we're doing it. Sure. So this is the Give Campaign. It is, yes. You, you mentioned that a lot of this requires a lot of funding. Yes. So make your pitch. Why should people donate to Remfi during the Give Campaign? What What are they going to get? What are you going to do? What are they going to get? What's going to happen? What's the community going to get by donating to Remfi during this campaign? Sure. First, I'll start by saying we're really appreciative of, of, of being a, selected as a participant in Give again this year. Um, it is one of our most important fundraising events of the year. Um, and, and aside from just the fundraising, I appreciate the the attention and exposure that a lot of um, these really important and meaningful um, nonprofit organizations get through the Give campaign. So I just want to shout out Give and um, and say thank you for that. Yeah. So every single dollar that is contributed through the Give campaign to Rimfi will go back directly to the places that we all know, love, and use in our community. Um, places like Garden of the Gods. Places like. Palmer Park, Stratton Open Space, you know, you name it. Um, we work there and the funding that we receive through the Give campaign is instrumental in making sure that work gets done. So some examples of things that can, can be accomplished, right? Um, so the Devil's Playground Trail funding will help, help support that trail. Um, again, that's all these projects are funding dependent and, and um, you know, so every single dollar will go towards these projects. Um, you know, places like um, Blodgett Open Space, doing reroutes to protect um, habitat up there. Um, it helps with our operations. So, you know, it's not just an organization of people. There's a lot of, of stuff that, that goes into it as well in terms of equipment, um, 
proper protective equipment. Um, truck transmissions. Truck trans. <laughs> truck transmissions. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No. <laughs> things I mean, happen. Things do happen, and yeah. they happen often. Um, yeah. So every single cent is appreciated and valued. Um, you can also help us unlock matching funding. So we have over forty thousand dollars in matching grants, and um, you know, getting us to that point, um, you know, would be a massive, massive. Um, win for us in terms of, you know, being able to provide, um, you know, more better in volunteer engagement, right? So we can, we can reach out to, to more underrepresented communities that, that, you know, that have a voice. Um, and, and we want to be able to, to reach those folks as well in, in everything that we do. Um, it really will just go fund the whole operation and, and, um, you know, I like to sum it up really um, as saying, you know, Rimfi, we take care of the places that take care of us. And so through the Give campaign, you can help us do that. You know, if there's a particular park that's really special to you or a particular trail that you want to see um, get some love and attention, let us know that. Make a donation and let us know. And, and, and we can do our best to, to make sure that we're, we're treating these places um, as, you want to, as you want them to be treated. So, um, yeah, I would say just every dollar counts. And we appreciate any support we can get. One of the things I've always appreciated that you guys have done and a lot of other groups in the, in the Give campaign have done is by leveraging the donations to get matching grants um, or you get a challenge grant for somebody who says, hey, if you get people to donate $1,000, I'll donate another $1,000 or something along those lines. So it's not just that you're just asking people, we're going to go with what they give. You're leveraging that to make more dollars out of the dollars that you're given. Yeah, we have some amazing um, supporters who who have pledged some significant dollars um, in match. And, you know, the only way we can unlock, the, you know, those matching dollars is if the community um, comes out and supports us. Um, that's why we need every single person who cares about our parks, trails and open spaces in in the Pikes Peak region to consider contributing. Um, this money, again, goes directly to those places. Um so uh, to me, it seems like a win-win, right? I mean, everybody wins. The, the folks in the community will get to see improvements in their favorite parks and, and, on, their, and on their favorite trails. And we'll win in the sense that we can increase our capacity to do that. Um, so, yeah, I just want to say thank you to everyone who has contributed um, and also reach out to those who, who are thinking about it and, and encourage you to do so. Um, it's a great organization. I love working at Rimfi. I love being a representative of Rimfi. Um, and I think we do amazing work. Um, it's a great community of supporters and volunteers. Um, and yeah, every dollar you, every dollar you contribute puts us that much closer to, to making sure that we can take care of these places in perpetuity. So I'm thinking about some of the places that I've been closely associated with the Mount Muskoko trail couldn't have been done with without your help, you know, Remfi's up. I know it was before you were there, but if, if you've hiked that trail, and we built that trail some years ago, and we built that trail, and right after that trail, we had torrential rains, and that trail was held up. I mean, that what comes with having good quality expert people building the trails. The Dixon Trail in Cheyenne Mountain State Park to the top of Cheyenne Mountain, a lot of Remfi work went in there. That's a great trail. That trail was held up. The trail you, you spent six years building down in the Sangre de Cristos is going to be a great trail. Uh, the and it's already the reports I've heard people going from Willow Lake up to Challenger and Kit Carson are already saying it's such a better route than it was before you guys went in there and worked with it. It takes time. The Devil's Playground Trail, yeah, it was kind of an okay trail, the tree line, then it just went to crap after that. It's got to be a lot better because you guys are working on it. These are the kind of things that you guys are doing out there that people can point their finger at and say, I've been there, you've been the Garden of the Gods, you've been on a trail you guys have worked on. And these are the kind of things you guys can point to. So I can't say enough about the work that your group does. And what I like is that you're doing the the down and dirty, hands on. We're going to get dirty. We're going to work up a sweat. We're actually going to do the actual physical labor. This is what you guys do down there. Yeah. Thanks for saying all that. I appreciate it, Bob. Yeah, we are the boots on the ground, you know, conservation stewardship nonprofit here in the Pikes Peak region. Um, And I wouldn't want it any other way. Um, we love getting dirty. We love getting sweaty. Sometimes we bleed a little bit, hopefully not as often as minor stuff. It's all minor stuff. It's all minor. Yeah, exactly. But my, my point is, is, is yes, right. These are things that, 
that people can experience, you know, personally every single day if they so choose, right? Like, I think something that makes Pikes Peak region, Colorado Springs, one of the most amazing places to live is that kind of access to outdoor recreation. Um, you know, I don't want to beat the same drum, but, you know, we saw through the COVID-19 pandemic that, you know, these parks, open spaces, and trails are one of the few places people can go to really um, get some reprieve and, and some, um, you know, stress release and exercise. It builds healthier communities. And so we need these places. Right. Every single one of us needs these places. And, and your support will, will help go towards taking care of these places and making sure that they're around for, for generations after us. Um, you know, it doesn't stop with us. It, it keeps going and going, right. People need these places, um, to live a happy, healthy life. And, um, your contributions will help us do that. So people say, I only have so much money to donate, but I want to, and every dollar counts. We know that, but I want to do do more. Can they volunteer with you guys to, when your season opens back up? absolutely please come out and volunteer with us um again i don't want to again same old drum with the pandemic but you know our volunteers almost dropped off the cliff during 2020 and then 2021 we were i was super thrilled to see um you know we we engaged over 700 volunteers this year we're at just at a thousand volunteers engaged and we want to keep that engagement going so yes come volunteer with us We've got all kinds of different projects you can participate in. If you want to help build a new trail, you can come part, you can come volunteer on the Devil's Playground Trail. If you want to help with um, wildlife restoration work, you can come volunteer through our Watershed Health Improvement Project. There's all kinds of things you can do for all abilities, ages. Um, we we want every single member of the community to come out and participate in our in our programming. Um, so you can. So when our season does begin, it'll it's going to begin um, next March. Um, so once, uh, once that kicks off, we'll have all of those volunteer opportunities available on our website at our volunteer and events calendar. Um, you can sign up online. Um, if online's not your thing, call us up and we'd love to just get you plugged in anyway, you know, whatever we can do to get you out there, getting your hands dirty and, and helping our parks and trails. Um, we would, we would love to have you real quick. Tell everybody what your website address is. So the rep, the website is rmfi.org, rimfi.org. Cool. Well, and you, get, you guys have a great newsletter that comes out every once in a while with a lot of information. It's really well well done and very loaded with information. Uh, folks, donate to the to, to Remfi during the Give campaign. You've got when this comes out, you have just about ten days left in the in the campaign. You've got plenty of time. Whatever you can give them is going to work out great. And the work they're doing out here, I can't say enough about how tremendous it is. I've been so happy to be associated with them just by doing this kind of stuff. And every once in a while, I go out and get my hands dirty with you guys. Not nearly as much as I'd like to, but try to get out there and get my hands dirty, too. We'll get you out there at least to check out check out the Devil's Playground trail I've got year. to come out there next yeah. year. I've got to do that. Carl, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you, Bob. I really appreciate your you know your continued support of Rimfi and everything that we do. And uh, yes, please consider giving through the Give campaign. Um through to Rimfi or many of the other awesome nonprofits that are participating. So um, whatever you do helps. So appreciate you. So you can go to their website, rmfi.org for a link to it, or it's givepikespeak.org also to donate to, to the Give campaign. Check on the Great Outdoors category. That's right. Nailed it. Thanks, Bob. All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening to the Outdoors Hiking Bob podcast. Before you go, did you know you can rate and review our Studio 809 podcasts? That will help us. Because our egos really need to have thousands and thousands of listeners. But that helps our wonderful sponsors reach more ears, too. And we do love our sponsors. So just go to Studio 809 or any individual 809 podcast in your iTunes or podcast app and click on Ratings and Reviews. Thanks.